I hope you had a great holiday. Um, our goal today is to continue our discussion from last week, uh, organometallics. Um, now this is the second part. We will focus on a couple of things here. Um, we're going to go through three different, uh, three additional ligands. Uh, the first is a pi system, the second is uh, alkyl, and third is carbenes. And um, after that, we're going to go over a concept called covalent bond classification. Um, this is a way to uh, provide more insight into the type of bonding between the ligand and the metal. All right. Um, so <coughs> uh, on the pi systems, we're going to go over a couple of common ligands. Uh, you'll find additional ones on the text, but those uh, listed here will be the most important in my mind. Um, the first type is uh, ethylene, uh, basically any type of carbon-carbon uh, double bond. Uh, now to understand the interaction here, you have to uh, start with the uh, molecular orbital diagram of ethylene pi system, and that is listed on the, uh, on the top. And here you will see uh, ethylene's pi system has a bonding orbital and the uh, anti-bonding orbital, the bonding orbital is failed, the anti-bonding is not. Uh, this kind of electronic structure allows two different kinds of interactions uh, shown on the bottom. The first is uh, sigma type donation. Um, that's the donation of the pi electron to the, to the metal. So uh, this may sound counterintuitive. Uh, even though the ligand is using the pi electron, the type of interaction is sigma. Uh, at the same time, there's a pi star orbital, so uh, ethylene can uh, serve as a pi acceptor at the same time and getting electron density from the metal's d orbital. So there will be a sigma donation and a pi acceptance. Now overall, uh, the ethylene molecule uses two of the carbon atoms to uh, interact with the metal ion. So that would be a um, bidentate ligand or uh, the way we call it in uh, argmetallics, uh, diheptal uh, ligand. Uh, the earliest known and most famous example of this uh, type of interaction is uh, the uh, ethylene complex coordinated to platinum. Uh, stru partial structure of the complex is shown on the bottom right. Uh, here you can see the platinum interact with the double bond and the four hydrogen atoms um, slightly moved away from the platinum atom. All right, move up one carbon atom. We have allyl as the ligand. And this is a ligand that has three carbon atoms. Uh, each carbon atom has a free uh, p electron in the, in the orbital. And uh, the three p orbitals interact to form uh, extended pi system. Uh, you look at the electronic structure, which is shown on the top middle. Uh, there are three uh, pi amos uh, bonding a non-bonding and anti-bonding. So the non-bonding uh, the, the non orbital has one electron and the bonding has two. And you see a pattern here in that the number of nodal planes uh, increase as you uh, increase the energy of the, uh, of the MO. The bonding MO has no nodal plane. Uh, the non-bonding has one and the uh, anti-bonding has two. Uh, this ligand can serve either as a, a triheptal or monoheptal form. Uh, in, the, uh, in the triheptal form, it can use uh, all its three uh, pi amos to interact with the metal, uh, shown on the bottom left. You can see that uh, the pi bonding can interact with uh, either uh, the dz squared or pz orbital of the metal. Uh, the uh, non-bonding can uh, interact with the dx, uh, sorry, dyz or uh, py uh, orbital of the metal because they have the same kind of uh, same kind of uh, symmetry. And similarly, the anti-bonding orbital can uh, interact with the dxz or the px uh, orbital of the metal again because they have the same kind of symmetry. Okay. And on the, uh, in the middle bottom uh, shows two examples of allyl metal complex. And uh, you can see in both cases, the metal are, in, uh, the tri uh, are interacting with the allyl ligand uh, in a uh, triheptal format. On the right hand side shows 
a different type of interaction, the monoheptal form. And in this case, it's um, essentially forming a metal carbon single bond between the ligand and the metal. And this is actually similar to the alkyl complex uh, that we will be discussing in a moment. Um, for the ring pi system, um, the most common and the most famous one is the cyclopentadienyl, uh, C5H5 minus, um, commonly uh, called CP, cyclopentadienyl, CP. Okay. And you can see uh, there are uh, five amyls. Uh, of the five, uh, three are uh, bonding, so the the lowest one is highly bonding. Uh, the other two are uh, degenerated in energy, are slightly bonding, and the uh, top two are anti-bonding. Uh, in charged neutral cyclopentadienyl, uh, you we have five electrons to fill the D system, and uh, this will fill up to uh, to the degenerated uh, uh, two uh, bonding orbitals. Uh, when you form coordination complex, most often you're going to use the anion form. So in that case, you're going to have six electrons uh, that will fill up all the bonding orbitals. And that actually makes it a uh, closed syst uh, valence gel system. Uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, cyclopentadienyl anion is so stable. Uh, the most uh, likely coordination mode of this ligand is uh, pentaheptal, uh, but it can serve in other uh, coronation uh, capabilities uh, such as triheptal and monoheptal. Uh, the way you make those uh, complexes is to typically react a metal salt uh, with a uh, sodium uh, with a cyclopentadienyl anion and that will uh, produce a, a typically sandwiched structure. Um, you can also add additional ligands, as you can see from the bottom right, this titanium complex it has two CP rings, but at an angle, and uh, that provides additional coordinate site to, uh, uh, to have uh, carbonyl coming in. Uh, there's also a ligand uh, that often found in uh, organometallic chemistry, um, is uh, pentamethylsubstituted cyclopentadienyl. Uh, this ligand is typically abbreviated as a CP star. Uh, you may have encountered this uh, in your literature search if your term paper is on uh, organometallics. Uh, on the bottom middle, you'll see a structure of uh, substitute ferrocene um, with 10 methyl groups on the two uh, CP rings. So that's um, uh, very similar to the ferrocene structure. Now, before we move to the next slide, uh, I'd like you to uh, do a very um, uh, short exercise. Uh, let's recall the 18 electron rule uh, that we have learned in the previous lecture. I'd like you to count the number of electrons in the ferrocene and also in the titanium complex shown on the bottom right and uh, think about how the 18 electron rule can explain the different coronation geometry uh, of the two complexes. Um, so you should now pause the video and spend a minute or two uh, to run the numbers. And when you're done, you can uh, resume the video. All right, uh, let's uh, go over this together. Uh, for the ferrocene, uh, let's assume both the metal and the ligands are charge neutral. So in that case, iron should have eight electrons to begin with, valence shell electrons to begin with. And each CP ring provides five electrons to the metal and the total is eight plus five plus five, so that's 18. So ferrocene satisfies 18 electron rule. Now if we go to titanium, um, uh, titanium should start with uh, four electrons and each CP ring provides five, so that's a total of 14. Now uh, two carbonyls each provide two, so that's another four, so that's a total of 18, okay? So um, by comparing the electron counting, you can probably figure out why the titanium complex wants to have two additional carbonyl because the titanium complex does not have 18 electrons if it only has two CP rings. Uh, in that case, uh, it would only have 14. So 
there's a strong driving force for the titanium complex to accept two additional ligands, in this case carbonyls, uh, to come to the 18 electron count. All right, uh, going to the electronic structure, um, shown here is um, uh, a molecular orbital diagram um, for the ferrocin. On the left is uh, the iron atom with its 3D, 4S, and 4P orbitals. On the right-hand side are the ferrocin's uh, group orbitals. Um, now, the group orbitals are basically linear combinations of uh, the MO molecular orbitals of the two CP rings, uh, the ones that have the same kind of symmetry, uh, first form a linear combination, and then those linear combinations interact uh, with the uh, atomic orbitals on the other side, uh, on the iron side, to form uh, uh, molecular orbitals for, uh, for the ferrocin. Uh, the most important part of, uh, of this diagram is, uh, is, sh is um, in, shown in that uh, uh, square. Um, rectangle, I'm sorry. And those are basically the D splitting, uh, D orbital splitting patterns that we previously encountered in the OH and the TD complexes. In this case, the splitting pattern is slightly different. Um, you'll see that it has two um, orbitals um, having bonding character. One is almost non bonding and two anti bonding. Uh, if you look at uh, the right side of the uh, of the slide, you'll see the interaction pattern. The two bondings are dxy and then dx squared minus y squared. And the non-bonding is uh, essentially coming from dz squared. And the anti-bonding ones are dxy, uh, dxz and dyz. Uh, in terms of uh, electron filling, um, the uh, electron fills all the way to the non-bonding. And if you look at the uh, energy level splitting, you'll find the energy uh, separation between the bonding and non-bonding levels are pretty small uh, compared to uh, the separation between the non-bonding and anti-bonding. So uh, that's another uh, reason that uh, is, uh, this complex likes to achieve 18 electrons, um, but it will be pretty hard, but not impossible, uh, to achieve 19 electrons. Actually, uh, there are other uh, metal CP complexes, for example, cobalt. Um, there's a cobalt thing. It's, um, that's a complex where there's a cobalt atom sandwiched by two CP rings, uh, very similar to, to the ferrocin. Uh, for the cobalt thing complex, um, its electron count is 19 uh, instead of 18. Um, and that actually makes cobalt thing a very strong reducing agent um, because that additional electron uh, resides in the anti-bonding orbital uh, dyz or dxz and uh, the the complex has a strong driving force to lose that electron to achieve 18 electron count all right next we have alkyl complex uh, this is essentially a single uh, bond between the metal and the carbon atom now the carbon atoms can be uh, either sp3, sp2, or sp. Um, the nature of the bonding is the same. It's basically a sigma bond. Uh, the structure of the sp3 carbon metal bond is shown on the top left. And a couple of examples uh, are, are shown in the middle. The synthesis of this uh, complexes are pretty straightforward. Uh, basically start with a negatively charged uh, carbon anion. Um, and rack that with a metal salt or a, a coronation complex. And the uh, negatively charged carbon can uh, carry out nucleophilic attack and replace existing ligands on the metal center to form uh, a metal carbon bond. Uh, next, we have carbene. Um, this is uh, um, essentially a double bond between uh, metal and carbon. Uh, carbene is essentially a Bi radical. Um, uh, the, the simplest example is CH2. So if you think about the structure of CH2, the carbon atom uh, wants to have four bonds, but it only has two hydrogen atoms. Um, so the rest two uh, electrons uh, are free to form additional bond with the metal. Uh, depending on the electronic structure of the carbene, uh, there are two types of interactions uh, with the metal. 
Uh, the first type, uh, we kind of call it Fisher type, uh, because it was first uh, discovered by a scientist named Fisher. Um, in this case, uh, the two electrons in the carbene are uh, paired in one orbital, so it's a singlet uh, because the total spin is zero. Uh, Fisher carbene is typically very stable um, and uh, not very sensitive to air and water. Uh, the key structure feature of Fischer carbene is that there's a heteroatom that is highly electronegative um, attached to the alpha carbon. Uh, the alpha carbon is the carbon that uh, directly bonds to the metal center. Uh, Fischer carbene is typically found uh, in late transition metals, uh, iron, ruthenium, uh, that sort of uh, atom. The second type is called uh, uh, Schrack type. Uh, this is uh, interaction between metal and the triplet carbene. In the triplet carbene, the two uh, electrons are located in two different orbitals, so this is essentially a bi-radical. Uh, Schrack type uh, carbene complex are much less stable, they're much more reactive. Um, Structure-wise, a uh, key feature is that there's no uh, heteroatom attached to the uh, alpha carbon. Instead, you only find either protons or uh, uh, alkyl ligands uh, on, the, on the alpha carbon. They are typically found in the early transition metals, uh, such as titanium. Uh, on the bottom left uh, shows the kind of orbital interaction you would expect for Fischer type carbene. And here you see a, a metal carbon sigma bond, and in addition, uh, there is a uh, uh, pi interaction between the d orbital of the metal and the existing pi system on the, uh, on the, uh, on the ligand. Uh, on the right hand side, it shows uh, synthesis of Fischer type carbene. Um, here you have a, a carbon anion attacking a carbonyl ligand on the chromium complex. And this creates an uh, A cell complex uh, coordinated to chromium. And uh, there are two resonance structures. In one, you have CO double bond and uh, carbon chromium single bond. In the other uh, resonance structure, you have a CO and a single bond and the negatively charged oxygen. And in addition, there is a carbon chromium uh, double bond. And the difference between these two structures are where the negative charge are located and also where the double bond are located. And in the right-hand side resonance structure, there's a carbon chromium double bond. So uh, this would uh, be the uh, kind of interaction you would expect for carbene. All right, um, this is the last section of this uh, lecture. And uh, here we're gonna discuss a new concept called covalent bond classification method. Uh, this is a way to uh, classify and uh, group coordination complexes um, not based on the type of ligands or the number of ligands, um, but instead based on the in intrinsic, more fundamental nature of ligand metal interaction. Uh, based on this class classification methods, uh, method, there's, there are two, three different kinds of ligands. Uh, one is called L-type, uh, second is X-type, and third is Z-type. Uh, to figure out what type uh, a ligand belongs to, um, we can start from a charge neutral complex and assume the ligands are all charge neutral. Uh, under this assumption, uh, an L-type ligand uh, is a ligand that has a, a molecular orbital that donates a pair of electrons to the metal. An X-type ligand is a ligand that has a molecular orbital that donates one electron to the metal. And a Z-type is a ligand that has an orbital that accepts a pair of electrons from the metal. Uh, so as you see from the slide, I emphasize that the definition is based on the interaction between the molecular orbital of the ligand with the metal. Uh, that's important because uh, some of the um, multi-dented ligands in you know, organ metallic chemistry can have multiple orbitals interact with the ligand at the same time. So uh, what that means is one ligand can have both L and X characters at the same time, 
you can also have both um, z and x characters at the same time, so on and so forth. So let's look at a couple of examples below. Uh, Carbonyl, for example, is a, a strong sigma donor, uh, so it has L character. Benzene uh, can donate six electrons at the same time to the metal, so that makes it uh, th three times uh, uh, L-type ligand, so we're going to call it L3. Uh, chlorine atom, uh, bromine, fluorine, those kind of ligands, um, in their charged neutral form, uh, they will only donate one electron to the metal because they already have seven. They want uh, just one carbon, uh, carbon ligand single bond to fulfill its uh, octet rule. So that makes them X-type instead of L-type. Again, keep in mind, we're, we are assuming the ligands are charged neutral species. Uh, BF3 uh, is a Z-type because it is a Lewis acid. Uh, so that's another thing. Uh, L-type ligands are typically Lewis bases, and um, uh, and Z-types are um, are essentially Lewis acids. Methyl group is another type of X ligand, and CP. This is uh, the uh, the complication we discussed before. CP has, as you recall from the MO diagram. Let's go back. In the MO diagram, uh, there are uh, three MOs with electrons. Two of the MOs are filled with two uh, electrons or two uh, or a pair of electrons. The third one is filled with only one single electron. So uh, this makes CP in its charged neutral form a 2L plus X type of ligand. So that would be L2X. All right, so those are for charged neutral complexes. Uh, for charged complexes, uh, we, uh, we're only going to do one uh, uh, modification from the procedure above. We simply assume the charges of the complex are all located on the ligands. Okay. Now, once you move the charge on the ligands, then um, the, the, the nature with their interaction with the ligand, uh, with the metal, is going to be different. Okay. So imagine if you have an X type of ligand, this ligand um, typically well, only donates one electron in its charged neutral form. But once you add a negative charge onto an X type of ligand, now it has a pair of electrons to donate to the metal. So that will make it an L type instead. So the other way around is if you have an L type ligand, then you have a positive charge. And the positive charge will e effectively remove one electron from the L type ligand and makes it into an X-type. Okay? So you can find a similar uh, convergence. For example, Z-type ligand is effectively an X-type ligand. X-type plus is essentially a Z-type. And you can add additional electron to L-type ligand. Now this ligand will have three electrons, two in pairs, and third one in single form. So that will make it L, L, that will make it L-X-type ligand. Okay, so once you uh, figure out the nature of the uh, ligands, you can, uh, you can add them up uh, to figure out the total number of L, X, or Z type ligands in that complex. And that's what, what, we, what we're gonna do here. So we have four complexes here. And I want you to again uh, pause the video for four or five minutes and analyze each one of the structure and what you need to do is to figure out how many L-type and X-type and Z-type ligands are uh, in each complex. And once you're done, you can resume the video and we can go over them together. All right, uh, I have my answers shown here. Uh, for ferrocin, uh, we have discussed before uh, each ferrocin ring is L2X, so you have two of them, so it's uh, L4X2. Uh, for the second iron complex, um, we have two carbonyls, so that's L2. We have two uh, uh, phosphines, so each phosphine is charged neutral form, it's a sigma donor as well, so that's another 2L. And then we have a bromine, we have methyl group, and those two are X types. So overall we have ML4X2. 
Uh, third one on the bottom left, uh, we have uh, uh, a negatively charged uh, anion, and uh, we have two carbon nails and one CP ring. So uh, since this is negatively charged complex, we're going to localize the negative charge onto the CP ring for now. And that one makes the CP ring uh, L2X minus. Now X minus is essentially uh, L. So the negative charge CP ring is essentially L3. And the two carbon nails are each L. So we have uh, ML5. Uh, the last one, we have uh, four carbon nails, uh, one bromine, so that's uh, 4L and 1X. And the last one is a carbene. Uh, a carbene, uh, in this case, forms a double bond, so that's essentially another L, because it essentially donates two electrons uh, to the metal. So that will make it ML5X1. All right, uh, so that's the end of uh, the lecture today. Um, on uh, Wednesday, we're going to have uh, a quiz that focuses on the past two video lectures. Um, I already posted a homework uh, on, the, uh, on the course web, and uh, on Wednesday, I'm going to uh, post additional uh, exercises, and in, uh, in the class, we're going to go over additional um, problems together. Um, all right, see you on Wednesday.